we're going to continue with our second session. Yes, now we are going to continue with the wonderful guest. She's Susan Asfari. Uh, and as previously stated, Susan is the founder of the Galileo Foundation. She's also co-founder and trustee of the Asfari Foundation, which aims to help young people make a valuable contribution to society by empowering them through education, research, and the power of free thinking. In addition to this, she's a board member of the US Middle East Project, advisory board member of Challenge to Change, and member of the Palestinian Development Organization, the Welfare Association. She's also the founder of Cook and Films. So welcome, Sosan, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for inviting me. Um, shall I start? Uh, um, when we speak about everyday resistance, the existence of the Palestinians in itself is an act of resistance. resistance. Um, to go through the checkpoints in order to get to work or to school or to see family who live in another area, that's in itself activism every day. Everyday resistance is when they take away part of your land, but you still try to harvest the other part. Or when you try to pick the olives in harvesting season and the Israeli settlers shoot at you while the army watches and does nothing. Resistance is women embroidering dresses to keep the traditional Palestinian dress alive, with each dress representing a different village. Everyday resistance comes in all forms. It's in the goal of keeping the young people educated, engaged, and active in their communities. However, today I'll be speaking mainly about the position of the Palestinian citizens in Israel, their activism and everyday resistance. Though I do need to put some historical facts in context first. Uh, the 1917 Balfour Declaration was issued by the British government that allowed the establishment of Palestine as a Jewish homeland, and that set the stage for the ethnic cleansing of 750,000 Palestinians from their homes and villages by Zionist forces, which culminated in the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. Rada Karmi, the Palestinian writer, cites in her book entitled Married to Another Man that in the 1880s, two German rabbis were sent by a Jewish fund to explore Palestine as an option for a Jewish homeland. They said on their return, the bride is very beautiful, but she's married to another man, meaning Palestine already belonged to another people. But this fact is today ignored. We often hear that Palestine was a land without a people for a people without a land. This historical revisionism serves as a cover for the erasure of indigenous culture, the theft of land, the plundering of Palestinian libraries, the decimation of Palestinian cultural sites and villages. This occurred on a major scale and continues today. After the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948, about 150,000 Palestinians remained within Israel's borders. Golda Meir, Prime Minister of Israel in 1969, was asked, what will you do with the Arabs in Israel? She answered, the old will die and the young will forget. Though the old have died, the young have certainly not forgotten. If anything, time and technology has helped the Palestinian minority in Israel to better organize themselves and connect with the Palestinians in the West Bank, the diaspora, and the world at large. The internet and social media sites have helped the Palestinians everywhere make their case to the world and show that everyday abuses that they endure. Online technology has seen the increased activity of online activism, of sites such as the Electronic Intifada and several digital organizations that promote the Palestinian cause on a global level. Today, the Palestinians in Israel make up about 20% of the population. And although they are considered Israeli citizens, they are treated as second-class citizens. Jewish and Palestinian children are educated in separate but parallel systems, and the curriculum is identical. Their educational department is directed by the members of the Jewish majority, and the curriculum is decided by the authorities with little input from the Arabs. There are no maps that show pre-1948 Palestinian settlements, only Jewish ones. This aims to show that Palestine had no history of its own. There is no mention about the history or the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians or the destruction of villages. The Palestinians are portrayed quite negatively as a violent, backward people who should be grateful to the Zionist colonizers. The education system suppresses the students' knowledge and identification with Palestinians. They are required to read Zionist literature and poetry, which celebrates the establishment of this Jewish state, even though for the Palestinians, this marks the Nakba, 
or catastrophe of when their Palestinian homeland was stolen and the creation of Israel was declared. The purpose of not teaching Arabic literature and authors to Palestinians is to keep their culture suppressed, preventing them from developing an awareness of a national identity and political ambitions. It is a tool by which a whole minority is controlled. The state educational system crystallizes the alienation of the Palestinian minority and reflects the character of the state. Two years ago, with blatant disregard for its Arab community, Israel declared itself formally as a Jewish and democratic state only for its Jewish citizens, and the Arab language was demoted. The impact of this discriminatory funding has a domino effect that plays out across the board in terms of facilities, teaching quality, and class sizes. The average number of students is 18% higher in Palestinian classrooms. Basically, discrimination between the two systems affects every aspect of life. The inequalities in schooling impacts on the Palestinians' opportunities in higher education, which in turn has a knock-on effect for job prospects and the economic health of the community as a whole. The systematic discrimination is part of a regime that aims to keep the Palestinian citizen inferior to that of the Zionist citizen. When the famous poet Mahmoud Darwish was 12 years old, he wrote a poem about the inequality between the lives of Jewish and Arab boys. For that, he was summoned by the Israeli military governor and told his father would be fired from his job if he ever wrote like this again. During his lifetime, Darwish was imprisoned five times by the Israeli authority for reciting poetry. His poems were thought to be detrimental to Israel's security and stability. The poem was called ID Card. There are many cases of people still being sent to jail for simply writing a poem or a social media post. We have seen a great increase in resistance through poetry, literature, and social media. So how to resist this oppressive reality? There are several peaceful ways of resisting oppression. First, resistance through reclaiming land and abandoned spaces. In March 1976, there were protests against land expropriation by the Israeli government of thousands of acres that belonged to the Arab citizens of Israel. On that day, many people were killed, and this date became a landmark that serves the collective narrative of the theft of the land. And it is now commemorated as Land Day every year on the 3rd of March. Despite it being a peaceful kind of resistance, unarmed citizens are frequently shot at, despite that there is an increase in turnout every year except this COVID year. The Palestinian citizens in Israel continue to try to reclaim some of the abandoned villages, but they are always eventually cleared off the land after Israeli army intervention. However, a phenomenon has grown in the last few years where communities are organizing themselves and holding some of their celebrations, weddings, and religious ceremonies in their abandoned villages. They are not allowed to stay or build on the land, but these active activists are using old places to reclaim heritage and memories. Palestinians should also seek international support and protection when holding peaceful protests and activities. Also, some of the international funders, such as the EU and other foreign donors, should demand financial compensation from Israel when a project that they have funded gets bombed and the infrastructure gets destroyed. If one resides in European or Western country, one should put pressure on one's government not to practice institutionalized government censorship in support of Israel. The last few years has seen Britain involvement in cultural repression of Palestinians through denying of visas, forcing theaters to accept certain policies, and censoring any speakers who are deemed anti-Zionist. International human rights lawyers would also be good to connect with to highlight violations of land theft. Public pressure has to be kept up to force Israel to reconsider persecution of some activists. An example of that is Darin Tatur, a young woman who was imprisoned a few years ago for her Facebook post and a poem entitled, Resist My People Resist. She was sent to prison for three months, but with public Western pressure, she was released. NGOs working with the people on the ground should be supported. For example, at the Galilee Foundation, we support educational programs, but these are awarded conditional on attendance at workshops that require students to learn about Palestinian heritage, reinforcement of national identity and community service. Visits to raised villages are organized and research into Palestinian heritage is done. The process of cultural and linguistic alienation of Palestinian youth is ongoing. 
And though we believe in promoting harmony in society and peaceful coexistence, we also believe that indigenous Palestinian people must be able to preserve their own culture and heritage. Our scholarship program is not just about academic support for the underprivileged students, but it is also about serving the community and educating youth to become change makers in the society they live in. Because of the disparity at the starting line, educational organizations aim to level the playing field, as they say, to allow Palestinians to compete in top universities, which will enable them to qualify for future opportunities. This is resistance and empowerment through education. To that end, there are organizations that the gallery supports that work with the Arab students to prepare them for the psychometric exam needed to enter Israeli universities. There is also a new generation of Palestinian heritage NGOs that continue organizing on a local social level, but thinking on a global one. And there seems to be a traditional synergy between heritage arts and liberation politics. The paradigm for the Palestinians is shifting. The flowering of a strong film culture, art and art represents a part of the state building project and is a form of resistance against the settler colonialist reality. Theater, film, cultural exchanges with the West have all helped raise awareness to the thriving culture of the Palestinian community. There are now several well-known Palestinian filmmakers who have won awards on the world stage. Directors like Anne-Marie Jasser, Hani Abu Asad, Elias Sleiman, and most recently Farah Nabalsi have all created films that tell the Palestinian story through a creative lens rather than a purely political one. Though, of course, as we all know, everything is political and the mere existence of Palestinians is political. Symbols and iconography in film have power. Salt of the Sea, a film directed by Anne-Marie Jasser, shows a Palestinian landscape marked by raised villages and ghostly settlements. In the film, the main character, a Palestinian-American, spends the night in an ancient ring. They are pushed out, told the site is of archaeological importance, alluding to the way history and knowledge is weaponized in service of cultural erasure. The camera here is a tool of resistance, the instrument which Palestinian artists use to disrupt the traditional narrative underpinning the Israeli state. Another director, Michelle Khleifa's film, Ma'lul celebrates its own destruction, shows the annual tradition certain Palestinian Christians and their descendants undertake, visiting the village they can no longer return to, now raised and buried beneath the trees. The yearly picnic is satirical, but the action is radical. As a wise Palestinian refugee utters in the film, rights do not disappear as long as someone claims them. Film is a connecting thread to a fertile memory, and the education is too. So when we speak about everyday resistance, the existence of the Palestinians is itself an act of resistance. And I just want to mention here that um, Farah Nabilsi's short film called The Present has been uh, nominated for uh, the Oscars, and we found that out a few hours ago. So if you get a chance to see it, please do. Finally, I believe working closely and coordinating with Israeli Jewish organizations that believe in human rights, justice, and equality of citizens is the key to moving forward. Organizations such as Beit Salem and several other Israeli NGOs are making headways in the West and, and, and globally and representing an alternative view of the future, a more just and equal existence. Thank you. Thank you, Sosa. Thank you for your participation. Now we are going to move forward and I'm going to try to share my screen, uh, but I would just go directly to Professor Chiara De Cesari. Uh, she's an associate professor in European studies and cultural studies at the University of Amsterdam. Her wide-ranging research explores how forms of memory, heritage, art, and cultural politics are shifting under conditions of contemporary globalization and state transformation. Um, Chiara will present together with Professor Alessandro Petti. So welcome, Chiara and Alessandro. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paloma, for the kind introduction. May I suggest that you also present Alessandro Petty, given that we will give a joint talk? Absolutely. So we don't have a break in between because I'll first speak and then he will speak and I might come back later. Absolutely. Um, Alessandro, which I don't see him, um, 
Alessandro is a professor of architecture and social justice at the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm. Alongside Sandy Hilal, he co-founded the Colonizing Architecture Art Research. Alessandro combines theoretical research with an architectural, artistic and pedagogical practice engaged in the struggle for justice and equality. In 2012, with Sandy Hilal, he founded Campus in Camps, an experimental educational program in one of the refugee camps in Bethlehem. So welcome to Alessandro and Chiara. Uh, thank you, Paloma. Thank you, uh, Tony. Thank you, uh, Luz, for the kind invitation and the uh, pleasure to participate in this uh, really a uh, lovely panel and which is fleshing out some key issues uh, in heritage today so just a quick note to how we will proceed i will we alessandro and i will give a joint talk and the plan is that i will first introduce you to um uh, Palestinian heritage and the politics of Palestinian heritage, which uh, with a special focus on the West Bank. And I thank, and, and uh, you know, it's um, my presentation connects in many ways to Southern previous presentation. And I'm glad to pick up some of the threads that uh, she has introduced. Then Alessandro will show some visual and talk about the important project he has been involved in and particularly refugee heritage which is a very good example of the kind of heritage that is being produced uh, in Palestine and beyond today and finally uh, I will just share some thoughts and questions about how this work and project uh, 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 about this work and project in relation to the panel as a whole. Uh, to start, I just uh, want to anticipate that uh, we would like to emphasize an, an, uh, uh, sorry, an expanded and positive notion of heritage as resistance that participates in processes of societal reconstruction and resilience, uh, what I call creative institutionalism. That is the ways in which society, civil society and resistant actors can mobilize heritage as a site for political claim making in ways that open up to different futures and future institutions in particular. So in other words, we want to emphasize how different kinds of heritage experiments in the global south and by oppressed communities may offer sort of the, the building blocks, the beginning of visions for the future, for a more just future in heritage and beyond. So I will, uh, Sausan has talked about uh, uh, Palestinians in 1948 in what is uh, in Israel. And while I will focus more on, I will say something about Palestinian heritage uh, initiatives in the West Bank. And then Alessandro will talk about the West Bank and transnational project, even though the kind of heritage that we uh, uh, are talking about is very much trans transnational and linking sort of across multiple scales. So uh, uh, Palestinian heritage is also very relevant because there is right now in, in the West Bank, in particular, I talk about the West Bank because this is the reality I know best. There is a proliferation of heritage projects and particularly urban regeneration and re urban regeneration projects and uh, museums. Uh, these efforts to reclaim and assert Palestinian heritage differ significantly from the typical global cultural project. Here it is people's cultural memory and living environment, threatened living environments, rather than ancient history and archaeology that take center stage. It is local civil society and NGOs, not state actors, who are doing heritage in this context. Significantly, heritage has become a very important language for Palestinians to frame and actively claim their rights to the land and as a way to intervene into the landscape to counter colonization, both physical colonization and also cultural colonization. In a way similar to the spread of the discourse of human rights, heritage has proved central to the Palestinian struggle for self-determination. 
So Palestinian heritage, that's our point a little bit, has become not just a practice of resistance, but, as a, but a resourceful, if improvised, and at times an informal mode of governing the Palestinian landscape. So the West Bank, in other words, is home to creative, uh, if not always successful, forms of experimentation and to resourceful attempts to reverse colonial violence. Perhaps a model of how heritage could be, does, uh, could be otherwise elsewhere as well. Now, just before I uh, introduce uh, uh, the specific project, of course, I need to emphasize how sort of the political role of heritage is, of course, in, in, in Palestine and Israel and the Middle East at large is, of course, not a new thing. Of course, heritage was crucial to the European colonial project in the Middle East and uh, 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 biblical archaeology in particular provided what it conceived of uh, as the material evidence of the cradle of Western civilization and the precious remains that were better taken care of by Europeans. And of course, this was a very fundamental, this is, was a very central logic to the colonizing project in the Middle East. And this continued with Zionism and the creation of the State of Israel. And of course, this has also to do with the very ways in which settler colonialism work. And this was also pointed at uh, 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 by Sousa. So settler colonialism destroys indeed or appropriates what it encounters to build a new society on the rubble of the native one, on an expropriated land base. In this context, then, the preservation of a rooted indigenous culture and cultural heritage becomes deeply, deeply politically salient by making certain that colonialism and settler colonialism are never ultimately triumphant. This explains then why the reproduction of a collective memory and identity and heritage work is so important for Palestinians, and why, especially since the 90s, Palestinian, a Palestinian memory and heritage boom has produced a vibrant popular culture of restoring the past. And again, this is the context of the proliferating urban regeneration projects that are the material side of this phenomenon. And again, this is not new in a way the tradition of uh, the link between heritage and resistance in Palestine has a very long history. It goes back at least to the beginning of the 20th century and the beginning of the nationalist movement, but I have no time to go uh, in depth into this. Just to introduce a bit what Alessandro uh, 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 will show, uh, is uh, are a quick notes about the kind of urban regeneration projects that are taking place. Um, in the last 20 years, a large sections of the Palestinian old cities have been in the West Bank have been restored significantly uh, in Hebron, in East Jerusalem, in Bethlehem, in Ramallah, in, Lab in Nablus, and all by non or semi governmental organizations. And this organization, the kind of work that they do is really championing a localized narrative of heritage as socioeconomic development that appropriates and reworks in very interesting and I would say future showing, future opening ways, global circulating ideas about adaptive reuse of heritage. So uh, this kind of reactive, these ways in the ways in which Palestinians reactivates ruins of the past to resist colonization and experiment with the institutions is certainly, it goes beyond the resistance in the sense that it produces sites of renewal that uh, are very much about experimenting with future institutions and not only as a fighting, as a fight against the status quo. And Alessandro's uh, work and uh, with uh, decolonizing architecture and with campus in camps and refugee heritage is a very good example of that. And I will leave the floor to him. Thank you, Chiara. Um, I thought that since we don't have so much time and also because we would like maybe to use um, some images just to take you in a specific place, which is the Hesha refugee camp, where um, this artistic research took place. 
um, and materialized since 2014. Um, and this is part of this ongoing um, research that is uh, on one way, I guess, um, destabilizing the dominant notion of heritage. At the same time also is also um, um, destabilizing also a common understanding of what is a refugee camp. Um, so maybe I will share this video and then I would be happy maybe in the sessions of question and answer to talk a little bit more about uh, the background and some of the interesting discussions that this project uh, brought. Do refugee camps have history? Alessandro? Yeah. This was I see a whiteboard, so maybe you shared the, the wrong screen. Oops, thank you for telling actually this. <laughs> <laughs> one second, then I do it again. See if I can share the right one. Sorry for that. Um, this one maybe. Do refugee camps have history? This was the fundamental question at the base of the nomination of the Hesha refugee camp as UNESCO World Heritage Site. Refugee camps are established with the intention of being demolished. They are not accepted to have a history or a future. They are meant to be forgotten. The history of refugee camps is constantly erased, dismissed by states, humanitarian organizations, international agencies, and even by refugee community themselves, in fear that any acknowledgement of the present undermines their right of return. The only history, in fact, that is recognized within refugee communities is one of violence, suffering, and humiliation. How then we understand the life and the culture that people built in camps, despite suffering and marginalization? The photo that you see here are part of the UNESCO dossier produced in over two years of discussions with refugee communities, local residents, heritage experts and cultural producers. Members of the camp strongly expressed their fear that the nomination would change the status quo and threaten to undermine the legally recognized right of return. At the same time, many expressed their desire to see refugee history being acknowledged and attempt to bring back the right of return at the center of the political discussion. We were interested here in documenting the life, the spaces and the political structures that emerge in almost seven 
decades of exile. Palestinian camps are not made anymore of tents, they are complex urban structure, and we don't have the right vocabulary to understand and describe this forced condition of permanent temporariness. In understanding today's refugee condition beyond the humanitarian crisis, refugee heritage traces, documents, reveals, and represent refugee history beyond the narrative of suffering and displacement. خلدة قطرة التينة القسطينة تل الترمس الفالوجة عراق المنشية القبيبة الدوايمة بيت جبرين بيت نتيف علار خربة التنور راس أبو عمار القبو بيت عطاب سفلة بيت محسير الشوع عسلين صرعة عرطوف دير رفات دير الهوى لفتة دير ياسين عين كارم المالحة سطاف صوبة خربة اللوز كسلة دير عبان الجورة زكريا البريج كدنا ذكرين دير الدبان دير الشيخ جرش مغلس عجور الولج These are the names of the villages of origin of which Palestinians were expelled and now reside in the Haysha refugee camp. Israel demolished more than 300 villages in 1948 in order to prevent Palestinians from returning to their homes. Today, only a few public buildings like schools, mosques and cemeteries are standing as material evidence to the expulsion of the Palestinians. Today, these villages have for the most part been substituted with exclusive Jewish-Israeli towns, national parks, and industrial areas. Refugee camps and villages of origin are associated with the same history of displacement and disposition. They are both in legal limbo and suspended. On the one hand, the camp is a permanent temporary space of emergency carved out of the state sovereignty. While on the other hand, the village is legally defined by the Israeli state as absentee property. Despite their geographical separations, the two sides clearly have direct links and connections. Therefore, we see the possibility and the urgency of nominating the Haysha refugee camp and the 44 villages of origin as a serial, transboundary World Heritage Site according to the UNESCO World Heritage Site criteria.
Chiara. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara, and thank you, Alessandro. Now we are going to present our last uh, guest, uh, Dr. Sarah Mallet. Welcome, Sarah. Uh, Sarah is a postdoctoral researcher on the Pitt Rivers Museum Action for Restitution to Africa project. Her previous role at the Pitt Rivers Museum involved the research in the visual and material culture of the Calais jungle. And she was one of the co-curators of the major temporary exhibition Lande, the Calais jungle and beyond on display at the Pitt Rivers Museum. She has multidisciplinary background, including medieval story and scientific archeology. span Her current research has focused on borders and migration as well as the story of camps in Northern France. In relation with two contemporary events, she's the co-author with Professor Dan Hicks of the book Lande, the Calais Jungle and Beyond, published by Bristol University in 2019. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm, um, I have to say I'm a bit intimidated to present after Alessandro and Chiara because their work was hugely influential um, in our thinking when we when we worked on land and on refugee material culture so um, yeah, I feel a bit like yeah a bit a bit intimidated but I'll just power through. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen just um, gonna put that full screen yes uh, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, an archaeological um, investigation of the jungle the famous refugee camp in France um, as it existed in 2015 and 16. And I'm going to talk about two projects, the Dangle project and the Lawn project, uh, which are uh, complementary, as it were, and sort of happen in parallel uh, in 2019 and 2020 before the world stopped. Um, so for this work, what I've done is that I've explored the material dimension of contemporary immigration but, and the state of, of the borders, the UK borders in France, um, but also we have used archaeology and we have re-thought of archaeology and anthropology as a form of activism, making visible what otherwise would not be visible, what would be pushed to the margin of society and um, British and French society. So the argument here that we present, that present is that by looking at the material culture of a camp through the lens of archaeology, uh, we can sort of account for the political, cultural, historical, social, geographical, you name it, trends that led to 10,000 of people living in northern France uh, in a refugee camp between 2015 and 16. It continues very much to this day. There's still lots of people living in absolutely atrocious condition in, in northern France at the moment. Um, but I, again, my focus is mostly 2015 and 16. So as I said, I'm going to work about two projects, and the first is a Dangle project, which was um, in partnership with the Museum of London Archaeology. They, um, they host, I guess, for want of a better word, a collection of objects that was collected by Gideon Mendel, who is a photographer. He picked this up in the camp for an exhibition in 2017 in London. Um, Gideon is an activist um, and a photographer, so obviously that sort of that was a stepping or work was stepped in this from the beginning, as it were, um, which was a sort of very traditional archaeological look at this um, contemporary material. And the second project, Land, um, is a collection that was assembled with a collective of refugees and activists and which was on display at the Pit River Museum in 2019. And um, so uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about both these things. I just want to say quickly at the beginning that um, the, there is a distinction between refugees and migrants and people could write books and theses about it. I tend to use refugees because the people we worked with uh, wanted that, so we, it comes from them actually. They, they wanted that identity for them was important, so if I say refugees, it be, it's because of that, but obviously I'm aware of a sort of, you know, how loaded both, these, both refugees and migrants term are. 
So to get us started, I'm going to briefly talk about contemporary archaeology, uh, which is um, a growing field in archaeology, or probably even a growing field now in archaeology, which engage with the remains of the present and the recent past. And what it does, it brings an archaeological lens to um, to like current social problem and issues, and it sort of allows us to look at. I, I would agree that it, it allows us to look at. Um, or, or world as it is today um, differently and allows us to sort of like, as I was saying in the introduction, sort of um, sort of make visible what would otherwise sort of just yeah be ignored, be, be sort of um, maybe even hidden uh, and undocumented. But it's quite a lot that's been done on the archaeology of forced migration and borders. If anyone wants any reference and papers, I'd be more than happy to, um, to send that your way if you, if you get in touch with me. Um, the strength of using archaeology, I would argue, uh, for the study of forced migration is that um, it kind of allows to look beyond the idea of the state of exception and, and the, the idea of it's a crisis. It really um, allows us to dive deep into the, as I said again, like the historical social context that explain why 10,000s of people lived in Northern France in the condition that they did in, in 2015. Um, to see the jungle as just a crisis or a symptom of a crisis sort of, to me, is problematic because it's just a short temporal framing and it does deflect for, from, you know, from the fact that the situation did not was not created in a vacuum. It, it's not an accident that there were ten thousand of people, um, ten thousand, well, not just ten thousand of people living in northern France, but that there is a constant refugee presence um, in in this landscape. And another thing about um, about archaeology is that what it does really is that it looks at the entanglement between people and material and process and knowledge, and the attempt in the global north to um, avoid the obligation of, of asylum, which, which is an obligation, um, as had a material impact on the world for the proliferation of borders and checkpoints and paperwork, you know, the establishment of refugee camp, uh, the, the flu of people and, 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 and material around the world, all of this is, is um, shaping our world in a way that archaeology can help us look at. And another thing with which uh, I find I think um, archaeology can be useful for is that archaeology is very powerful to engage the public. Like it does really grab people's attention when you tell them you do an archaeology of something recent. Uh, people are you know very interested. They want to sort of not quite sure what you're all about. And um, and you know here we use archaeology as a form of activism with with absolutely no apology. Like we we recognise that the history of a discipline is colonial. It was developed um, to to justify all sorts of, of form of nationalism. Still is to this day. Um, I'm sure, like anyone who's been on Twitter and has seen the sort of rule of, a, um, you know, like um, for example, like the use of the term Anglo-Saxon and things like that. Um, so I think here we want to say that, of course, our discipline is political, and of course, um, we have to sort of, as it were, take a stand. Um, and say this is what's happening and this is this is where we are. Personally, I think. I know some people disagree with this, but that, that's where I'm at. Uh, I'm going to briefly talk about the British border in France because that's the sort of the geographical framing. I realise I don't have much time, but that's the geographical landscape that I'm talking about. So um, the British border is located in northern France, in, in Calais. Similarly, the French border is located in Kent, but that's much less of a problem. So Calais has become this sort of like experimental place in which Europe sort of um, tries on with this sort of external border regime that they've got. So the EU has, has exported this border to third, third party states such as um, Niger and Turkey and Libya. But this one is happening sort of inside of Europe and it's a British border. So it's a bit of a strange situation. It serves the British government very well because they can pretend that the refugee a crisis, a crisis, I'm using that word, but so the refugee situation is a French problem, not a British one. Um, and it's kind of interesting to see how that's going to evolve um, with, with Brexit. But since 2014, the British government has sent quite a lot of money uh, for France to sort of manage this border. And um, 
the situation there was dreadful in 2015 and 16 and still very much is to this day like it's getting worse and worse and like the, the violence that the people will leave their face from the french police is absolutely horrendous um you know people possession the little they have gets taken away gets destroyed um tents get taken away blankets sleeping bag gets taken away it's a sort of game of exhaustion who's going to give up first like whether it's the refugee themselves the people who help them or the police the first time i was there it seems that the police was um what they were doing was like peeing on sleeping bag so that's you know it's absolutely horrendous what's going on as i said it's still very much going on the french state denies that they were uh, the report of uh, the recourse to unreasonable force uh but uh, they, you know, the, the organization on the ground have very detailed report of what actually is going on. And it's been deadly, as you can imagine. Um, according to the Institute of Race Relations, they published a report in November 2020, 292 people have lost their lives in the channel since 1919, um, including 36 children. So that's the British hostile environment in France is, um, is just, it's just horrendous, it's just absolutely dreadful. The best known jungle is the one that was that dominated the media in 2015, but it's actually a word that's been used probably since the 80s or 90s. It's kind of defined all informal camp in northern France. Um, and it comes from the word jungle, which means wood, which was first used in 2009, I think, um, um, at least in the French press. And um, as I said, this is something that's been happening since the 80s with camp being like appearing, being dismantled. The one in 2015 was started as a tolerated encampment outside the city because the city official decided that there were too many refugees inside at, in the city centre or living in tents in the city centre, so decided to sort of push everyone out. Um, and from that on, the camp grew really quickly, uh, but it grew with no other site from the traditional sort of state or humanitarian actors it was a completely sort of organic site um, at the beginning anyway and it became an urban space with restaurants and mosques and churches and um he attracted loads of attention i think one of my favorite stories about the camp is that someone had a very successful restaurant and was trying to build a second level uh, and uh, quite a lot of people said it was a terrible idea it was going to collapse very quickly but it was um that vibrant space of hospitality and, and solidarity and resilience. But it was also, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, a state of, oh, a space of absolutely terrible and tremendous violence, um, be, you know, uh, interpersonal violence, state violence, um, everything. So the camp was cleared in two phases in March 2016 and October 2016. And the, uh, again, um, it continues to this day that people still live there and the dismantlement and the destruction of possession seems to happen every day at the moment um, because the state is just trying to make this situation completely invisible like if you destroy any sort of like gathering or any site then sort of it doesn't exist and archaeology here can sort of bring it back into the light as it were sort of being like no actually we we, we know this is here and we, we can talk about it and use use material culture to say which resist as it were the, the of the attempt to invisible to make everything invisible. Uh, I've got, I think, yeah, that's the camp from, uh, I think it's a picture from 2016. So briefly, I'm going to talk about the Dangle project, which is the first of the two project. Uh, it was with Mola, so my colleague Louise Fowler at Museum of London Archaeology. And we recorded um, using the sort of Mola templates to 2,189 objects. They were all collected by Gideon. Um, and it was really interesting because they sort of show life in the camp and the sort of flow of object between France and Britain, sort of like, you know, tin from supermarket that don't exist in France and things like that. But what is, I think, of interest here um, and something that we wish we had more time to, um, <clears throat> to investigate is this sort of archaeological record of police violence. We recorded 548 fragments of tear gas, tear gas can sorry ranging in date from 1993 to 2016. So even if we acknowledge that there may be a little bit of a bias in what uh, Gideon picked up at the site, it's still quite a lot of tear gas canister. Uh, there's been many reports of the use of, of tear gas canister in the camp, like videos, um, with sort of medical evidence as well. Um, 
But what's really interesting here is that these were found inside the camp when the sort of official narrative is that they were only fired when people were gathering um, either on the port or by the highway or by the channel tunnel. So the fact that they were found inside the camp seems to indicate that actually they were also targeting where people lived, which, you know, it, it's it's the sort of traditional archaeology versus official history thing. So like the story says something and then the archaeological evidence is different. And um, we've not been able to investigate this as much as we wanted, but, um, you know, where we found them, I think is really interesting. Uh, there's also something that was, we found decorated ones that people use to like, you know, as flower pot in their home and things like that, which maybe Alessandro will correct me on that, but I think it's something which, uh, something which started in Palestinian refugee camp. And it's interesting to see this sort of knowledge of, of tradition of what to do with this object of violence and sort of to see how that traveled all the way to northern France, whether with, you know, people who travel from Palestine to France or whether they were um, um, refugees or whether they were activists. But, um, I found that quite interesting. And the long exhibition, which was um, at the Pit River Museum, was co-curated with a group of, um, of refugees and activists and was on display in 2019. So what we did was uh, reassemble visual and material culture from the camp. Um, and the project, the, you know, the first question about the project was like, what, what survives from the camp? And we contacted people, uh, we then contacted people, so we could have snowballed, we put ourselves up there and say, we would be interested in in seeing what everyone has kept from the camp. And then turn out lots of people had kept lots of things because um, this desire to document what had happened had been very strong with lots of people. So we, we ended up being, okay, we have this space and people are gonna bring us stuff. Um, it was extraordinary actually. I mean, someone even uh, suggested we display um, a fire truck and that's the only thing, the only time the museum said no was when I suggested, let's have a fire truck in, in there. I think they also said no to an unexploded tear gas canister, which was probably worse. Um, so we worked with a, a group, as I said, of refugees and activists who were there throughout the process. And um, the working with them like, was really interesting because uh, Nicola talked about this a bit in, in our presentation with Molkata, but working at the University of Oxford, the Pitt River Museum, like the structure of power that have been in place are quite difficult to move. And we are not, like people were extremely supportive and, um, you know, everyone I talked to was extremely supportive and wanting to help. But working with people who don't really fit the system in something that is like the University of Oxford was just, um, it, it was a minefield of, of, you know, for example, how do you work with people who don't necessarily have bank account don't you how do you work with people who don't necessarily um have the right to be in britain that you know some of them were working on the asylum paper and and things like that and um so even if we're trying to have like a sort of democratic co collective group well it wasn't really because we had all this obstacle put in a way um not not necessarily by anyone trying to stop us but just by by the system itself um we also wanted to work with someone who was in france and the, well he still is in france he his, his status is completely um settled in france but he for your office he had an interview we invited him we had a letter with, from the university of oxford we we're going to pay for for everything um, which you would have thought was enough, but he had an interview with the Home Office and the Home Office was absolutely dreadful to him and sort of told him that they wouldn't let him come to Britain because they suspected that if he came to Britain, he would stay in Britain um, since they knew he'd been in Calais. And that, for example, is something that, um, you know, he called me after that, that appointment with the Home Office and it was absolutely dreadful you know it's something that none of us had foreseen because we'd done everything as we were supposed to do he was like he, he had a passport he could travel he had traveled in Italy and Denmark with no problem and then suddenly like we couldn't bring him to Britain <clears throat> despite having the support of a university and it's all of these things that you don't necessarily um you know you want to work with people and you want to work with people in a way that's equal and part of my position and end up being facilitating this work but it's actually something that's fairly difficult unless you've got someone um sort of smoothing the edges as it were so it sort of made me think of how actually can you work with 
unusual partner as it were um in, in an institution like the University of Oxford like how can you make it in a way that's actually fair and it's not putting undue pressure on people that's not putting undue stress on people and that's not um and that at the end of the day is actually um sort of oh sorry what's the word I'm, I'm losing my word but at the end of the day something that's not um just for sure like just not for like you know talking a, a talking representation um so that's something that i was going to do a lot more on this last year and then obviously the work the world stopped so i'm sort of a bit still thinking on, on what we could have done and what we should have done one thing we did do in the space of exhibition though is that we raised the money for help refugees which are nothing going under the name choose love uh, for a contactless donation point so we choose to donate money directly to them instead of having passing it through us so the money would go directly to them that was really successful we raised five thousand pounds five thousand one hundred pounds uh, which would use um for um to house uh vulnerable people in the winter in calais so like families with children and stuff like that so that was that was really positive um what we wanted to do with the work really was to sort of show what was still going on in calais as i said sort of like bring it um bring it back to the, to the forefront um, and sort of remind people that it was still happening, it will still happen. Uh, this is a situation that is very much unsolvable from every point of view until, you know, until the border is removed really, uh, which I'm personally a fan of. But uh, um, And there were other, sorry, I realise that I'm really rambling right now. So very other issue and ethical question obviously about working like this. Um, with 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 refugees in a British museum, um, you know, around the issue of constant and fair um, compensations and things like that, and how we can actually work around the structure of power. I will end here. If you have any questions, please ask them. Um, as you can tell, I'm a bit rambling towards the end. But uh, sorry, if that's the exhibition, that's what it looked like. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. That was really brilliant and moving. Well, now we have. Uh... Uh, well, we are over the time, but uh, now we will uh, go to Tony and the questions. Yes, I'll have a little look at the question. I know that Sosan answered a question a little bit earlier, um, which was, does the Galilee Foundation do anything to reconnect Palestinian citizens of Israel with Palestinians living in the West Bank? Sosan, would you like me to just read out what you said or would you like to... Um, say, explain. Um, it's okay, you can read. I um, mean, you know, yes, we, we do try to co connect uh, students. We had several online workshops, and this year was problematic because of the COVID, uh, of course. But uh, we, we organized uh, trips to um, uh, towns in the West Bank, and we also have a new scholarship program with Al Quds University in the West Bank. So we have a chance of student cooperation and, and uh, communications. So yes, we uh, we do that, and I, I think there is another question. Shall I? Ask yeah, you? yeah. If you yeah, if you're happy to, I can I can read that out. Um, uh, as a result of being reconnected to their heritage, do Galilee Foundation scholarship students tend to identify as Palestinian citizens of Israel rather than Arab citizens of Israel? Actually, yes. I mean, the Palestinians in Israel have always identified as a Palestinian. But I think the term Arab, Israel likes to impose the term Arab because it generalizes the identity and they just become part of the Arab world at large. So uh, they, they all feel Palestinian and actually they feel that they need to uh, be connected to the Palestinian uh, uh, population in the West Bank and Gaza. They feel they're all part of one identity. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Kea uh, has asked a question for Sarah um, in the Q&A. Um, Thanks, Sarah, for your presentation. I find the canister evidence really interesting in, as you say, showing how archaeological evidence differs to official history. Beyond showing at, at exhibition, is there a way that activists or refugees may use this as a form of legal or political advocacy to, pr to prove state violence? Hi, uh, yeah, thank you for your question. There's actually so much to prove state violence, you know, from from people like, for one thing, people being hurt themselves. Um, 
object being being broken video films that people take of the police um being insanely violent but uh there was a report that came out if you can't remember the date but a few months ago i think by a human watch right group again not not tell you on the name but they have all this evidence um uh and they brought all this evidence to the um the police of police, I think, and all of this was dismissed. Like it's the the violence in Calais is like it exists. Everybody can see it. It doesn't really need to be proved anymore. That it's improved, but the states continue to deny that it's happening. I think the the Macron said something like a few years ago, which I found was kind of insane. He said that there was the violence in Calais. It was no violence in Calais because if there was violence in Calais from the police. Uh, it would be illegal, which is such a weird argument. Like, it can't happen because if it happened, it would be legal. It's just like, in that case, no crime ever happens ever because... Um, so yeah, no, it's it's a good question. Obviously, all of this is sort of like, at least tell people what's going on and sort of make people more aware of what's going on. In terms of actually holding the government accountable, it's not been very successful so far. Okay. Um, I know, pol uh, well, I. Would any of the other speakers like to uh, ask a question to those that have just presented? Uh, first of all, I know Paloma has a question, but uh, just to say, first of all, if you, if you do have, feel free. And if you want to share your faces, you can also as well. Okay, well, uh, if, if, then we'll go to Paloma. Paloma. Yes, thank you, Tony. Um, this is a question for uh, for Sarah, for Chiara, and Alessandro. Your work uh, approaches issues of permanence, impermanence, and temporariness, notions related to Hannah Arendt, uh, political concept of the space of appearance. And I'm just very curious why uh, two different projects find such a notion appealing to work with refugee camps. Who's gonna answer that? <laughs> I, I can go. For, is anyone else maybe would like to start? Don't go, go ahead. <laughs> um, I guess in, in our work, um, in a way we try to um, maybe build the positions that uh, somehow is not entrapped into this dichotomy between understanding uh, the camp simply as a humanitarian space or understanding or the future of the camp as a, um, taking the camp as a sort of space that can be normalized and be incorporated into the city. You know? In some ways, um, when you know, the discourse is somehow always um, trapped you know, in, into this dichotomy, um, of course, you know, we have to say that the camp should not exist in the first place. Maybe I should maybe emphasize this. We're talking about the camp not because we uh, romanticize or we like them, but, you know, they exist and they continue to, uh, unfortunately, be built as we speak. So I think someone that is interested also in, um, in practice and actions is not enough, you know, to say that it should not exist. They should not exist, but at the same time also we have to deal with them and and the question is therefore how one can build um you know a different critical position that is in one way not just repeating um enjoying you know the idea that the camp is just uh, a temporary conditions because more and more they are not and more and more this is the main excuse for not giving um you know people living in the camp their rights to the place where they are that is the official excuse because they are temporary and things, you know, would be uh, fixed soon. And we know that this, uh, in most of the cases, is not happening as it should. Um, but at the same time, also, it's difficult to build uh, and to believe that is, uh, you know, all of this is solved just by integrating the camp with the rest of the city. So the idea of permanent temporariness for us is uh, somehow how one can build, you know, a, um, a different uh, critical positions, you know, in which somehow 
um, you can you know do both at the same time, which is um, uh, record you know asking for uh, recognition of rights in the place where you are, and at the same time continuing fighting for the right of return. So I guess our political discussion got stuck you know into this sort of nation state framework. So we don't have to accept that. We don't have to accept that one has to decide, you know, either this or that. And this is a crack in the nation state. And this is where we want to somehow push our political imaginations. You know, is it possible that we are not imagining um, a, a political you know, solutions where people can belong to one, the, you know, one place, more than one place at the same time? How that is possible, you know, how that is possible if someone has to, uh, you know, be fixed in, in one single box. And this is where I guess the, the, the struggle of the refugees then, I think, can build solidarities, you know, with many other different uh, struggles that somehow uh, refuse normalizations, you know, refuse categorizations, refuse, you know, modernist uh, conceptions that somehow divide, you know, uh, in this sort of dichotomy public and private, you know, and all of these categories that we inherit from modernism. Um, so I guess that is a little bit what we have been trying to, you know, uh, locate our, our work, trying to, to, to show also the, you know, the failure of, of this uh, political organizations, but also at the same time, pointing out at the ways in which already in some of those camps, there, are, there is already traces of in the presence of, of a life that somehow can be liberated from this box of nation state. Well, thank you. Okay, can I add something to that, like about the the idea that because it's temporary, then it like we don't have to sort of care not 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 us, but like you know it's temporary, therefore we don't have to find a long term solution for it. But it especially in this in um in in Cali, it's a state itself that makes it temporary. Like the I think there is very much like you know every day they come in and dismantle whatever has been set up during the night, so it's sort of a circular argument like it's temporary, therefore we don't have to do anything, but we're going to make it temporary so we don't have to do anything. And for us, the temporality of a camp was important because when I started working on a project in two thousand and eighteen, I think or late two thousand seventeen, so many people told me like, "Why are you doing this? Like, there's nothing left." in Calais and when you told them like well actually it's been going on since the 1980s and it still continues it's been there for 30 years it's not just something that happened for six months uh, between 2015 and 16 people would be really surprised and shocked and I include people I'm French and even my own family was quite you know aware of which like of the situation in their own country had been going on for 30 years they just assumed it'd been a camp and then the camp was gone so what we tried to do here us what we tried to do with temporality was to sort of say well wait a minute actually let's take a step back and see how that is something much bigger than than what we sort of than what it appears and it like it's not just about uh, the UK border being in France, it actually goes back much further than that, and sort of like even in Britain, colonial past, because the people in France trying to go to Britain are, you know, they come from countries from um, not quite British. Us, uh, so that pretty we sort of look at it from a sort of long durée compared to the crisis, and that that was important to just sort of you know as a as a investigative tool, as it were. Thank you. Sarah. I can um, sort of jump in and perhaps uh, answer by asking a question that uh, was actually uh, close to a question that I wanted to sort of ask and offer to the uh, to sort of the panel and the audience as a question to reflect on, which is related to the kind of the performative aspect of heritage and the performative agency of heritage and what we can do with it and why we mobilize heritage to do certain things. Because, uh, 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 you know, when, when both Alessandro and Sara were talking about, I, on the one hand, kept on thinking that those issues, uh, sort of the question of permanent temporary, temporariness and some of the, the questions that are so, and the issues that are so clearly 
uh, and the tensions that are so clearly uh, at play in camps are actually more and more becoming sort of urban issues. So in a way, the camp is more and more, the logic of the camp is actually, uh, you know, uh, overcoming, it's uh, going beyond the camps, camps boundaries and becoming part of the ways in which cities functions. But um, uh, when both Sara and Alessandro were talking, I kept on thinking, you know, Alessandro refer back to the problem of the logic of the nation state that doesn't allow for the camps to be recognized the way they are. And then my question for me is then why to use both the logic, sort of the, the logic of heritage and um, proposing the Palestinian refugee camps to be nominated for the word heritage uh, list, which is very much, of course, built upon on the one end, the logic of the heritage and the logic of the nation state. And I, I profoundly believe in the sort of in the value of this move, but I just wanted to sort of ask to think a little bit about what does it mean, for example, to think about camps as on the one end, more of a sort of a, 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 like a, urban paradigm and also as a place so what does it mean to work in camps work with camps both through heritage and through world heritage in particular can i just say something uh, as, as a half palestinian half lebanese with you know we have so many um refugee camps in lebanon and uh, now there's refugee camps everywhere in the world. I actually struggled with the notion when you first mentioned that you're looking at the camp as a heritage site, because for me, maintaining heritage, it's about actual maintain maintenance, keeping uh, uh, the heritage alive. And for us, you know, we ideally, we want to see all the refugee camps uh, disappearing from, uh, from uh, Syria, from Lebanon, from Jordan. So I do struggle with the notion that you are looking at this refugee camp as a heritage site. And uh, I mean, I can understand because of the buildings, the way it's, it's uh, evolved, that it can become an iconic place, but I would look at it as a heritage place maybe after it's been abandoned, after the, the refugees have, have gone home, not while they are still living there. I don't know, I just, I, I struggle with the notion that it's, it's, uh, it's a heritage that has to be kept. So convince me. <laughs> no, thank you. That's very, no, thank you for the comment. It's very understandable. Um, unfortunately, you know, in this very compressed time, it, um, I'm sure that I will not be able to convince you, but uh, I, can, I can say something. Um, maybe trying also to fall back to what Chiara uh, asked. Um, the nomination is, first of all, um, a political uh, tactic. I think today, you know, the right of return is not at the center of the political discussions. So there is very little to, to actually lose. And we are interested, you know, in a, in a, in a practice that somehow can bring in all possible ways, you know, that at the center of the political discussions. And bringing the camp um, as a World Heritage site, what, what it does is, first of all, what it did, I have to maybe start from there, what it did for the people in the Haitia uh, and for the people that we work with, uh, it acknowledged their own story. You know, one thing that I witness um, uh, with our, in our program uh, where our students from the Haitian, for example, was that this constant erasure of any history that is linked to the refugee camp. And this is, you know, if you think that is a double violence because the only story that you can tell about the refugee camp is the story of misery and humiliation and nothing else because you have to convince the international community that that is what it is, which is in fact is but also, it's also made of many other things. And that where somehow heritage actually can have and can be mobilized in, uh, in an interesting way. And of course, cannot be normalized, you know, mo mobilized in, in the same way has, has been mobilized maybe within the dominant understanding in the World Heritage site. However, since uh, without that, we don't have any political agency. 
we are having these discussions because we are talking about that. We are talking about that possibilities. So in that sense, also for me, I, let's say for us was also a way to try to bring these conversations, first of all, in, in, in the camp with some kind of consequences, but also, you know, trying to bring this um, also among politicians that they were suddenly, um, they had to answer, why not? Would you say, you know, with all what refugee camps they represent, would you say they were not historical and they are not historical sites? No one could negate, you know, that the, the history of the refugee camps actually is a, is a history that belongs to the humanity, is a history also of resistance to the disappearance, is resistance, you know, with the fact that people don't want to normalize and in fact fight for their right of return. And many people see the camp as the site that which is more closer to the right of return. If you want to have any idea of the dialect in villages or you know the life in the villages, you actually go in the camp. That is where you have that feeling and that commitment and that form also as an intangible is something that we um, in the in the nomination of in, in the process of nominations, you know, we want to also to protect as as a way as a form of life that exists in the camp that doesn't exist in the city. And that I would say, you know, back to what Chiara was asking, that the camp also has a specific connotations that, in a way, it makes different from the city itself because of its history of being segregated, and 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 detached from from the rest of the city. So. But, you know, looking forward to have these discussions in many other occasions, you know, that is for us an ongoing conversations. So please join. <laughs> and just to add a little point to this, for us, it was very much because like the discourse was whatever was left in Calais was trash. And if you say that's trash, then you sort of like, it's easy to sort of um, dismiss the people who were in the camp as trash themselves because it's just trash all of this is like sort of temporary and trash and it is to make it heritage and turn it into heritage is not to say this is great and this is wonderful it's to say actually this has value and the people very have value and their story have value and as Alessandro was saying like um the refugee you know the Calais refugee camp is part of history of Europe and we can't just erase it as something that just happens it, it's it is part of our history it's part of, of Franco-British history it's actually I mean you could even go back through to the middle ages and look at Franco-British history and that would Calais would be significant in that as a as a border as a British landscape as a as, as a border and so there is, it is political it is very much to say actually what happened there needs to be to be known and needs to be investigated and me it needs to be um shown to the world i think uh, that's what i would say i think thank you thank you uh sarah for that um we don't have any more questions in the q a at the moment i'm aware that we're over time um let me have a little look at the chat see what's going on Yeah, if you have a if you have a question, if you could, if you could put it in the Q and A, that would be great. Obviously, I know uh, our speakers, uh, their time is organised so that it was going to finish at six o'clock. So um, I understand if you if you run out of time, um, but uh, if there's, I'm just keeping a little eye on the Q and A. Um, okay. Okay, um, there's a question in the chat by Marguerite Horner. Uh, and she says, just checking that I've got it all. It became an economic viable town. Uh, why cannot this be assimilated in the town? Um, they were obviously enterprising. My painting was in land aid curated by Sarah Malik called Friends. I have still hundreds of photos and filmed interviews. I went with the Shizik Combine nuns taking clothes on a humanitarian basis. Okay, that's not a comment. 
Okay. Hi, Margaret. Um, fancy seeing you. Uh, why he was not assimilated into the town was because just, you know, racism, <laughs> like quite, quite, quite simply, people didn't want to have, um, oh, it's actually quite complex how people react into it in Calais. Like it's, um, I met some people who would say, oh, we don't want refugees. We don't want these people here because they're not to our values. And then they would actually go into the camp and do laundry every week for them, which was quite interesting but yeah no it's just quite simply because um yeah they didn't they don't want like very very space in calais for people to to live there but also the people don't necessarily want to stay in calais like you know they want to cross to britain um some of them then move on to paris but um yeah it would be so much easier to just be like why why not just like have the suburbs of Calais and 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 build houses and the housing for these people was Margaret say would like you know with, with restaurants and bakery and, and bars and nightclub um I know of some people in Calais who actually went to get their bread in the camp because they said the bread was better than it was in the city um than the bakery in the city so yeah and um, you know if you suddenly have an influx of white refugees it'd be interesting to see how people react to that but I think yeah Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, Lewis, uh, I think, is going to talk about the, the following um, webinars, but I'd just like to say thank you all so much. They were really amazing presentations and I wish I could have given you much longer than 10 to 12 minutes, but you managed to fit it in fantastically. Um, I really, really appreciate you being here. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, Lewis, I'll pass on to you. Yeah, um, I'm just going to, uh, can I, wait, let me do this properly, where are we? Uh, just to repeat also what, what Tony and, and Paloma, of course, just said, like, thank you so much. That was really, really super interesting and really, um, I really enjoyed all the presentations and it would be so nice to talk more, but maybe in the future. Um, so I just, uh, that next week we have another webinar, which will be on the Tuesday, on the 23rd from 3 p.m. Uh, uh, UTC, so British time, uh, which is on institutional inequalities and unequal power relations. Um, this will be a bit of a shorter webinar. So we have four speakers um, and I will post also the link in the chat if you want to still sign up. And of course then in the, um, on the 29th and the 30th of uh, March, we also have a two-day conference uh, for which you can also find uh, more information on our website, ourworldheritage.org. Uh, and we hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Little thing saying about uh, the film Salt of the Sea. It, oh. it mentions the village that Chiara and, and Alessandro mentioned, the Dawami, and it also deals with the right of return. It's 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 an old film, but it's actually one of the few that made it to the Cannes Film Festival back in I think 2009 or 2007. So it's it's worth watching. Thanks so much. Thanks, awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Bye. 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 Bye.